Hi everyone, this is Ranjit and welcome to the next video in the Geom Algolib series. In this video, we will look at how to compute a centroid of a mesh. And more specifically, we will look at how to compute three different centroids for a given mesh. If you think of the mesh as having all of its mass in its vertices, then the center of mass of that mesh would be the average location of all of its vertices. That is what we call a vertex-based centroid. And instead, if you think of the mesh as having all of its mass in its faces, so as if the mesh uh, was made from a sheet material, where each triangular face is a sheet of uniform density, then the center of mass of such a mesh would be the area-based centroid of that mesh. And the third type of centroid we are going to learn how to compute is a volume-based centroid, and that is the most interesting of all the three. In, in, in terms of how we compute it. Uh, so if you think of the mesh as being completely filled inside with a material of uniform density, of course, uh, for a mesh to have a volume-based centroid, it must be a closed mesh. And for a closed mesh, if you think of it as being completely filled inside with the material of uniform density, the center of mass of such a mesh would be the volume-based centroid of that mesh. So let's jump right into the code and see how to calculate each of these centroids. Now, I haven't written the actual logic for this algorithm yet, but I did write the basic skeleton of the code. So the basic function calls the signatures and the chain of function calls that take a Rhino mesh in C sharp and pass it to our C++ unmanaged code to calculate the centroid. So I'll just walk you through uh, this skeleton code and then uh, we will jump into the actual algorithm itself. So the get centroid method that you see on the screen right now is the one that we will be calling from our grasshopper C sharp script component. So it takes a Rhino mesh as the first input parameter and a mesh centroid type enum as the second input parameter. If we take a peek inside the definition of this enum, we have three values representing the type of centroid that we want to compute. So it's vertex-based, area-based, and volume-based. So inside the body of this method, the basic steps that we follow are the same as, or rather similar to what they were last time when we were computing the volume of the mesh. If you haven't seen that video, I recommend that you go check it out. You should be able to find the link to it in the top right corner. So the first thing we do is combine the identical vertices of the mesh to clean up the topology. We then convert the mesh into an unmanaged mesh and get the memory location of that unmanaged mesh and put it in a local variable. We then call the mesh centroid pinvoke function, which uh, takes the mesh pointer, the memory address of the mesh, and three doubles by reference, which will be set to the coordinates of the centroid. And in addition to these, it, as the second input parameter, it also takes the type of the mesh centroid. So this enum value is actually getting marshaled to the C++ side. We will talk about how that works in just a minute. After that, we just delete the unmanaged mesh because we are done with it. And we then return the three coordinates that we received from our C++ code as a new Rhino point 3D structure. So if we jump over to the mesh header file, we can see the C++ counterpart of our mesh centroid p invoke function. And if we jump into the definition of this function, we can see that all we do here is call the centroid function of our mesh class and get the centroid as a, as a VEC3 instance and set the coordinates of this center to the return variables, which are passed by reference. Now, the second input parameter of our p invoke function is of type mesh centroid type. If we take a look at the definition of this type, it's uh, an enum class with three entries, vertex-based, area-based, and volume-based. All of this is defined in C++. So you might be wondering, how does C++ know how to convert a C-sharp enum into a C++ enum? Because we are calling this pinvoke function from C-sharp. So the process of marshalling takes care of this for us. So we don't really have to think about this at all. All we have to do in this case is make sure that the order of these three entries is the same on both sides and the number of entries also has to be the same but beyond that 
the spellings of the individual entries could be different. We could even call them something else, but we probably shouldn't because, you know, it would be very confusing. But yeah, as long as the order is the same, the marshalling can take care of the conversion for us. Now, if we take a look at our mesh class, we have two overloads of our centroid function, which we use in our pinvoke. And one of those overloads takes the mesh centroid type as the input parameter, while the other doesn't. If we take a peek at the definition of the first overload, we can see that internally it is just calling the other overload with the uh, vertex-based centroid as the type of the centroid. What that means is, by default, if if somebody who is calling the function doesn't know what type of centroid they want, uh, they are just going to get the vertex-based centroid because that is the simplest for us to compute. If we take a peek at the definition of the second overload, we can see that the body of that function is not implemented yet. So let's do that now. So let's start by handling the different types of centroid using a switch statement. The first case will be the vertex-based centroid and uh, we can calculate the vertex-based centroid as the average location of all the vertices. And we can do that by using the average function of the VEC3 structure. It's a static function and it accepts a range of VEC3 instances and returns the average. And for the other two cases, the area and the volume-based centroids, we are going to have to write some additional logic. So uh, let's encapsulate this logic in their own separate functions and just call those functions here. So I'm going to assume that there's a function called area centroid and another function called volume centroid. I'm just going to return those. And for the default case, we always uh, like fall back to computing the vertex based centroid because that is the most simplest. Now let's jump into our header file and add the declarations for the two functions that we used. The first one is area centroid and the second one is volume centroid. And of course, these two functions uh, should be uh, marked with the const keyword because they don't actually change the mesh. Let's start by adding a definition for the area centroid. The area centroid of a mesh is the weighted average of the centers of all faces and the weights used for that weighted average are the areas of the corresponding faces. So let's start by creating two vectors, one to store the centers of all faces and another to store the areas of all faces. And for both vectors, we already know the number of faces in advance. So we should reserve the required memory in advance to make it more efficient. We are then going to loop over all the faces of our mesh using for loop. And in each iteration of this loop, we are going to dereference the iterator to get the mesh face. And we are going to calculate the center of this uh, face using the get face center function. It's basically the average of the three vertices of that face. And once we have the center, uh, we push it back into the centers vector that we created before. And after that, we calculate and push back the area of this face as well. We calculate the area using the face area function. And then we just have to return the weighted average from these two vectors using these two vectors. And we can do that by calling the weighted average function of the VEC3 structure. It's a static function. It takes a range of vectors as input and also a range of doubles. And it returns a weighted average by using the doubles as the weights. And that essentially wraps up the logic inside this function. Now we can add the logic for the volume centroid computation. So the way we compute the volume centroid is actually very similar to the way we compute the volume of a triangle mesh with a very small number of differences, of course. Uh, so understanding the concepts that we use when we compute the volume is essential to be able to follow along uh, with the logic of the volume centroid computation. So if you haven't seen the last video on mesh volume computation, I strongly suggest that you pause this video now and go back and watch that other video first before continuing. You should be able to find the link to the other video either in the description or in the top right corner. So just like last time, we begin by choosing 
the center point of the bounding box as the reference point to construct our tetrahedrons. And once again, like last time, we're going to create a local buffer of VEC3 instances to store the vectors joining our reference point to the vertices of the mesh. We're going to uh, populate this uh, buffer the same way we did last time using the std transform. So we're going to just loop over all the vertices of the mesh and subtract the reference point from each of these vertices to get the vector joining the two. And these vectors will serve as the edges of our tetrahedrons later. We're then going to create two vectors, one to store all the centers of the tetrahedrons and another to store the volumes of those tetrahedrons. And because we know how many of these tetrahedrons we're going to have, we should reserve the required memory in advance. And it's going to, the number of tetrahedrons will be equal to the number of faces. And we're then going to loop over all the mesh faces in a simple for loop. And in each iteration of this loop, we're going to get the three vectors that join the vertices of this mesh face to the reference point. So these three vectors represent the edges of our tetrahedron. And we're going to use these three vectors to compute the volume of the tetrahedron, which is also what we did in the last video. And that volume is equal to the triple product of these three vectors divided by six. And we're going to take the absolute value because at the moment we want it to be positive and we're then going to decide if the volume is positive or negative depending on whether the corresponding mesh face is facing towards or away from the reference point. We can check this by seeing if the dot product of the face normal and one of the edges of the tetrahedron is less than zero. And if it is, we just invert the sign of the volume. And once we have the volume, we just have to push it back into our volumes vector. And to calculate the center of the tetrahedron, we have to get all four vertices of the tetrahedron. And one of the vertices is the reference point, which we already have. And the other three vertices are the vertices of the mesh face. So we just get these three vertices and store them in the local variables A, B, and C. And then we calculate the average of all four points, A, B, C, and reference point, and push it back into our centers vector. And once we exit out of this loop, we have all the centers and all the volumes. And in line 228, we just have to return the weighted average of all the centers where the weights are the volumes of the tetrahedrons. That will be our volume centroid. Now that we implemented all the logic, let's try to build the project and see if it builds without errors. Okay, it does. And now it's time to test it and see if our implementation actually works and returns the centroids that we want. So I just launched a debug session and opened up Grasshopper and I'm opening a file that I created before with the purpose of testing this algorithm. So within that file, there is a mesh that I created and internalized beforehand. It doesn't really represent a meaningful object, but it's designed deliberately to exaggerate the difference between the three types of centroids. So if we were to measure, or if we were to compute the three types of centroids for a spherical mesh, or a box mesh, like a cube or something. All, the, all three centroids will be at the same position and it will be really difficult for us to get an intuition for what these three types of centroids mean and how they behave and, and so on. Compared to like a spherical mesh or a box mesh, this mesh is different in the sense that on one side of the mesh, on the bottom side of the mesh, uh, it has a lot of vertices, they're all like, very small faces and you know high density of vertices and on the other side the density of vertices is very low we have these really large faces and like vertices spaced apart and on one side of the mesh you have lots of tiny faces and on the other side you have very few but large faces and on one side of the mesh you have these finger-like structures like branching finger finger-like structures which have very low volume and on the other side of the mesh, you have this bulky part with a lot of volume. And I already prepared this script component where I just call the mesh centroid, or rather get centroid function three times and pass in a different enum 
value in each call. First call is vertex based, second call is area based, and the third call is volume based. And I set the results of these three calls to the three output parameters and let's see what we get. And as expected, we got three points in our output. The first point is the vertex based centroid. Predictably, it's all the way over to the right where the density of the vertices is very high. The second point is the area based centroid. So on the left side, you have a lot of faces with very large areas. Because the areas are used as weights in the weighted average, the area based centroid is it's over to the left compared to the vertex based centroid. And the last point is the volume based centroid. And if you look at the mesh compared to the right side of the mesh, the left side of the mesh is a lot more bulkier and has a lot of volume. For that reason, the volume based centroid is even more to the left, even more so than the area based centroid. And yeah, looking at these three types of centroids, it looks like the it looks like all the logic that we wrote in this tutorial is working as we expected it to. So I call this a success and yeah, that concludes the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. I'm not sure if this will be the next video or, or you know, a video after that, but in some future video, I plan to cover the mathematics behind NURBS geometry. Uh, we will write all of that mathematics from scratch and learn it along the way. So see you then. Bye.